hello everybody and thank you again for joining us for today's webinar which is entitled lowering next gen sequencing dna input requirements and gaining access to more samples my name is beth fry and i'm a product manager here at lucigen and i'd like to welcome you all now i am very pleased to introduce today's speaker rob brazas Rob is a senior product manager here at Lucigen, and he has a wealth of technical bench experience in genomics, molecular biology, and protein biochemistry, along with array analysis and next-gen sequencing. And he has had uh, leading roles here in developing our innovative NGS products here at Lucigen. So we're very excited to have Rob presenting today's topic, lowering next-gen sequencing DNA input requirements and gaining access to more samples. Take it away, Rob. All right, Beth, thank you for that kind introduction. My favorite answer to that is always, with all that experience, it just means that I'm old. So anyway, I hope you all enjoy today's webinar. Um, let's just get straight into it. So here's the agenda. Um, there's a lot of, I hope, educational material in this webinar that talks about next-gen DNA sequencing uh, in general. So I want to go over and talk about fragment library prep to start off. Then I want to examine the effects of poor library construction. So what does it mean to have a bad library versus a good library? And then I want to talk about duplicates. So we're talking today about pushing the limits of, of library prep and going very, very low in the input amounts. And so everybody's going to be quite concerned with duplicates uh, when doing that. And so I want to talk uh, quite a bit about duplicates and some of the factors that affect duplicate rates. Then I want to talk about some of the current problems faced by you and other next-gen sequencing uh, researchers, um, stuff that we've learned by talking to customers and researchers, and then introduce um, a solution to a lot of those problems or a lot of those challenges, and that's our NextSeq Ultra Low DNA Library Kit. And we'll do the standard stuff, features and benefits, how it works, suitable applications, supporting data to support everything that I tell you about here. And of course, we'll finish up with a summary and contact information. Okay, so this slide just gives you an overview of how it all works. So basically, you need to start with DNA samples. Um, you need to extract those. Kyogen kits work great. There's a lot of high-quality DNA extraction kits out there. Once you do that, though, you need to shear the DNA or fragment the DNA into smaller fragments that are suitable for Illumina sequencing. Remember, I'm talking about Illumina um, strictly today, solely about Illumina. So you can do that by mechanical shearing with an instrument like a Kavaris. Um, AFA, or you can use enzymes to um, fragment the DNA down into smaller pieces. Generally, when I talk about shearing, I'm talking about these mechanical type approaches. Fragmentation, I'm talking about enzymes. Okay. Once you've got your DNA of the right size, uh, generally three to 500 base pairs, um, you need to create the library. And this is what we're going to talk about a lot today. So basically, library prep is taking those small DNA fragments and putting on all the sequences onto the ends that are needed for the Illumina sequencer. Once you do that, there's an optional PCR amplification step. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. But again, you can do PCR-free libraries with a kit like our NextSeq AMP Free low DNA library kit that we've talked about in the past. Or you can use this new kit we're going to talk about today and add a PCR amplification step. And there's benefits to that, and we'll talk about those. Then, once you've got your libraries, you can load them onto the Illumina sequencers, MySeqs, HiSeqs, NextSeqs, there's a variety of instruments out there, of course. And now, most of this is pretty quick these days, but uh, it all comes down to bioinformatics, and this is the last step in analyzing that huge wealth of data that you create off of these Illumina instruments. And so bioinformatics is a, is a long and, and generally difficult process. So um, that's usually where the bottlenecks are these days. But that kind of summarizes everything um, from start to finish. And so that brings us really to our first poll question um, that Beth is going to ask. And basically, are you doing sequencing now or do you plan on doing sequencing in the next six months? And so, oh, this is very interesting, very different than our, our response this morning. This morning it was 50-50. So it looks like most of you are doing uh, sequencing right now probably why you couldn't come to the 8 o'clock webinar. You were probably doing um, library prep while we spoke. So anyway, just kidding. Um, excellent. Well, thanks for that information, and uh, let's keep going. So hopefully some of this information will still be valuable to you, even though some of it's fairly basic and, uh, and general. So here's how, let's focus in now on DNA library prep itself. Here's how it works. So as I said, you start with a genomic DNA sample. 
it has to be broken down into smaller pieces, either by sonication or enzymatic methods. Now those fragments are small, but they're not perfectly blunt-ended. They'll often have overhangs uh, that need to be fixed. So the first step in, N, in uh, library prep is N repair and A tailing. So N repair makes everything blunt. A tailing adds an A to the three prime ends of these fragments. That's going to create a sticky end for adapter ligation. Once those um, fragments are N repaired and A tailed, you'll add in an adapter. That includes all the Illumina sequencing goodies on it. And then you will add in ligase, and you will ligate those adapters to the A-tailed fragments. And in a perfect world, every fragment in your library will have adapters at both ends. You need those adapters to, in order to sequence these um, fragments. If the adapters aren't there, they're not sequenceable, and you need both. So then there's, as I said, you could take this library, throw it directly on the Illumina instrument. Uh, my arrow is backwards, I apologize. Or you could do PCR amplification, make everything completely double-stranded and amplified, and put it on the sequencer as well. We're going to be talking about this pathway today, the PCR plus approach. Now, library complexity. This is a big topic, and this is probably the root of all um, sequencing data and, and, and generating the best possible sequencing data that you can. It's probably the most important um, aspect of that. So here's... Um, Genomic DNA sample, let's call it a single sample. The blue, the red, and the, and the gold represent uh, multiple copies of the same regions of that genomic DNA. You fragment it, break it up. In this case, I've broken up each strand into three or two fragments. So you've got 15 total. Very simplified approach, obviously. Example. End repair A tailing, adapter ligation, and in this best case perfect scenario, every fragment that you had in that starting library has adapters at both ends. So when you load those onto the sequencer, you get sequencing reads from every possible fragment, okay? Either dual, one from each end, or, um, or a single pair, single end read, whatever you want to do on the instrument. So what about in a not so perfect case? This is obviously what we all strive for. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult to do than you might imagine. And so here's what happens when you have a lower complexity or um, a poor library construction. Same DNA input, same end repair A tailing now, but what you'll notice is <clears throat> there's a couple A's missing from some of these fragments. So because of that, when you go to the adapter ligation step, those fragments can't accept the T-tailed adapter. Okay, they're incompatible and they won't ligate. So those fragments aren't going to be sequenceable. Then the other option or other possibility is that ligation doesn't work very well. It's not 100% efficient. So some of the fragments, even though they were A-tailed perfectly, can't be ligated or don't ligate to the adapter for whatever reason. Okay, and so in the end, when you put those that library on the sequencer, whoops, excuse me, When you put that library on the sequencer, what you end up with is missing fragments. Okay, These fragments are not sequenced because they don't have adapters at both ends. And this is, of course, a very simplified view of what's happening, but it's really important because what it means is you have lower complexity libraries, which lead to poor coverage and possibly more variability in that coverage depth. So the up and downs can be amplified because of missing fragments from specific areas, especially if they're difficult regions. Now let's move on, even though the slides wanted to do it by themselves. Now let's talk about duplicates. So that's talking about complexity of libraries and the importance of that basic molecular biology of adding those adapters. What about duplicates? We're talking about pushing the limits of NGS, DNA NGS, and so we want to be able to use more and more, smaller and smaller amounts of input DNA. So this slide shows you, and so duplicates are going to be a very important factor. So this slide just starts to talk about what duplicates are. So here's a reference genome. Here are um, clusters from the sequencing that we've done, and you've got a paired end sequencing, so this fragment gave this read, that read, and so on all the way through. And then the gray lines are the mapped inserts, so that's what's derived from that cluster, that's the um, mapped insert on the reference genome. And what you can see is that none of these represent duplicates, they're all unique. The reads are unique, they have different starting points, and the mapped inserts are all unique. Okay, So there are no duplicates in that example. Well, here's an example of if you had duplicates. So here across the top, these are all unique fragments like these up here, okay? Uh, unique mapped inserts, unique reads. 
But down here I've highlighted in the orange boxes, these are duplicates. So you can see that both the starting points of the reads are the same and the mapped inserts are all the same. So bioinformatically and in real life, they would, would be considered uh, duplicates, okay? And so, and that's the case for all five of these particular regions of the reference genome. And there's multiple programs out there. Here's a couple that do it, and they do it very differently. So FASTQC analyzes one read at a time, uh, read ones or read twos um, separately, okay? And it determines a duplicate based on the start site of the read. Okay, so it's a little bit less accurate than the second method. Okay, Picard uses both reads to determine duplicates. So basically they have to have an identical start on read one and an identical start on read two to be considered uh, duplicates again. So basically the mapped inserts are the same. Okay, so that's going to be quite a bit more accurate because you could have one end being the same but the other ends being different. Those aren't real duplicates. They all come from different fragments. Okay, all right. Now, what are the sources of duplicates? We're all worried about PCR, but there's a lot of potential sources of duplicates. So there's biological duplicates. So let's say your DNA sample is human. You've got multiple genomes in there because you've isolated it from more than one cell, the DNA from more than one cell. And when you go to shear or fragment the DNA, you end up with mostly random fragments, but just by chance, you create a couple of fragments that are identical. Those would, of course, be converted into sequenceable material and they would look like duplicates on the instrument, and they are, but they're biological duplicates. They just generate, they're just generated by random chance, either by shearing or fragmentation of the initial DNA samples, and you have more than one copy of your um, genome equivalent of your DNA in there, or of your genome in there. Now, there's PCR duplicates. This one's pretty straightforward. I think we all understand this one. Uh, in this case, you've got your fragment libraries. They're PCR amplified. In this case, I'm just showing two copies of each one. If you load that whole thing on the library on the sequencer and they all get sequenced, you'll obviously see these as duplicate reads on the instrument. You'll know that they came, obviously came from the same fragments. Okay. Then there's optical duplicates. This basically happens, I believe, on non-patterned flow cell sequencers. Um, this is basically where one cluster um, is interpreted as two. So this one has right here has an odd shape, and the instrument might read that inaccurately as two separate clusters because of the shape or the size. And so that's going to treat those as two clusters. You're going to get two sets of reads from that cluster, and it, they will be treated or identified as duplicates, as having come from different clusters. And that's why I put it in quotes here. They're not really different. They're the same cluster, just a weird shape, leads to the interpretation as being two. Okay. And then finally, XAMP duplicates. And we'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. But this occurs on patterned flow cell Illumina sequencers, like the HiSeq X instruments, the 3000, 4000, and NovaSeq. Basically, what happens here is these are nano wells on a flow cell in the, one of these instruments. And what happens during amplification of the fragments on those flow cells during cluster generation is one, the fragments can float off and seed other wells. And so what you see is, in this particular case, for some reason, two populated a whole bunch of um, nano wells in the general area, in the general vicinity. Probably not, you know, if I extended this out, you wouldn't see them out here and out here. But in the general vicinity, you start to see more duplicates. This has nothing to do with the library itself, but it does have to do with the instrument, okay? So it's another thing you need to keep in mind, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Now, another factor that has a great impact on sequencing duplicates is the amount of um, sequencing you do on each sample, okay? So in this, again, very simplified view, um, you have your reference genome. We have 10, I think, different uh, mapped inserts here for this reference genome. And there are 10 perfect duplicates or 10 identical mapped inserts for this region all the way across, okay? So in one, one of those is the unique one. We don't know which one it is, but nine of them are duplicates. So this is a 90% duplication rate if you do the math in this very simple example. Okay, well, what happens if you sample that library? So here you're looking at, let's say, all the reads, and now you only analyze 50% of the reads bioinformatically. Now, if, you, if the sampling was good, everything was uniform, you have one unique read, four duplicates, that's now an 80% duplication rate. So you went from 90 down to 80 just by sampling fewer and analyzing fewer reads. Now let's go one extreme further, 
20% sampling. So you only analyze one fifth of the reads from this original library. Now you're down to one unique and one dupe or 50% duplication rate. Now this is very much over, is exaggerated, but it is, um, it shows you what sampling can do to um, the number of duplicates that you see in a library. So what are some of the other factors? So you can control the number of duplicates that you look at or identify just by um, sampling fewer reads out of your library. You probably don't want to do that in most cases, but you just have to be aware that that's going to impact things. You could also um, have libraries loaded on the same instrument, same flow cell, for instance, you're multiplexing. One gave you a million reads, one gave you five million reads. If you analyze all the reads from both of those, you're going to get more duplicates most likely out of the five million reads. So you just have to keep be aware of that. And then sample multiplexing. So you could in fact sample, like I've shown here, by multiplexing. So if this was one sample on the instrument sequencer, but you complexed five of these, you would end up with this situation for each of the samples. Basically because you're loading less of each library on the instrument when you multiplex, you decrease the um, percent duplicates that you'll see. Okay, just ma just general math and and it's a a lot more complicated than this, but this is the general gist of it. Here's a real life example. So we made libraries from E. coli DNA, genomic DNA, with 50 picograms, 500 picograms, or 75 nanograms using this kit that we're talking about. We used different numbers of cycles, obviously, because we had a lot less DNA here than here. And we sampled the, li the results from the, li from the libraries. So from 100,000 reads all the way up to 2.7 million in this case, 100,000 to 5.4 million, 100,000 to 1.8 million. And then we calculated the number of duplicates. And as expected, as I just told you, as you sample more reads from the same exact library, you get an increase in the number of duplicates. Same thing, and it gets less dramatic as you use more DNA. And we'll talk about that. It's not just the PCR cycles. Remember, this DNA has more unique fragments in it than this DNA, just by the sheer number of genomes in here. And I'll give you a better example in a second about that, how important that is. So what do I want to take home from this so far? Well, um, I want to make sure that uh, everybody, when you do testing of like our library kit versus somebody else's kit, that you try to do an apples to apples comparison. So it's a fair comparison. So some recommendations when you're testing kits and, and comparing it, always make sure you use the same sheer DNA samples for all your libraries. It has a big impact. Use identical input amounts when possible. Okay, you'll see that we don't talk about the Illumina kit today for um, data quality because they only go down to 100 nanograms of input DNA, whereas we can go down to 50 picograms. So we didn't even include them in our comparisons. But you want to make sure you use the same input amount because it has an impact, like right here, right? Um, you want to use recommended manufacturer's protocols. Please do. Follow, they've been optimized by all of us, so try to use those protocols. Um, at least for your first experiments. Then you want to analyze the same number of reads, right? You don't want to, you know, analyze um, 2.7 million reads for this library versus 300,000 for this library. It's not a fair comparison, as we just talked about. And then use the same instrument type and the same and the um, sequence on the same day if possible, okay? And of course, use the same software for all of this analysis. Um, there's a lot of variability day to day on these instruments, um, independent of the libraries. All right, enough preaching on that. Now, here's the most other very important factor. So this is looking at a human, what happens if we make a human library from 50 picograms and put it on a HiSeq instrument? It's not going to go well, okay? There's going to be a huge number of duplicates. So let's just work through the math. So human genome, diploid genome size is 6 billion bases, okay? Haploid's about 3 billion, okay? Number of unique 300 base pair fragments from this. So let's say we want to make a 300 base pair library. The best you could absolutely do is 20 million unique fragments of 300 base pairs long from one genome, okay? Now, if one genome is about six picograms of DNA, in 50 picograms of total human genomic DNA, you have about 8.3 genome equivalents in there. So if you multiply 8.3 by 20 million, best case scenario, remember, you get 167 million unique fragments 
And again, this is the absolute perfect situation. It's not real life. So 167 unique um, frag fragments. Now, the high seek instrument has, you can make about 450 million clusters on there. So what does that tell you? If you want to load this single library on the HiSeq X, you're going to have to load PCR duplicates in order to fill up the instrument. So you're going to have to load basically 2.7 times the number of unique fragments that you had. So when you do all the math, that comes out, you can expect at least a 63% duplication rate. Okay? There's no way around it. And the best depth you could get, remember, real life depth is 8x basically, because you've only got eight genomes there. Okay, <clears throat> so keeping all that in mind, um, we can make pretty darn good libraries out of 50 picograms of human DNA. You just have to be aware of the expectations. What can you expect from there? And it very much depends on your experiment <clears throat> and depends on how well you do the bead cleanups, because every step you could lose some of those unique fragments, and then the fragmentation won't go perfectly either. So you'll have fewer sequenceable fragments just based on size and so forth. Some will be too small, some will be too big, and so forth. Okay, So this is a best case scenario, and it's just an example to show you. You have to be very careful about the size and complexity of your genome and the instrument that you're using uh, to analyze. Okay. All right, so finally I want to talk about XAMP. So I alluded to this earlier. I told you what this is. Here's an example. We sequenced human libraries, 10 nanogram libraries with our kit, Kappa Hyperprep and NEB. We ran these on a HiSeq X10, or had them run for us, and um, these duplication rates are horrible, right? 10 nanograms, we're like, what is going on? This is terrible. Well, it turns out it's XAMP duplication rates. It has nothing to do with the quality of the libraries. So here's the XAMP as we talked about. You end up getting some of the fragments floating off and, and landing in other nano wells to create what look like duplicates, or they are duplicates, but they're they're instrument duplicates and not um, library duplicates. So then what we did is we used a Clumpify program to bioinformatically remove those. Basically, Clumpify looks in certain regions and looks for duplicates in those regions. And you can set how big of that region is uh, with Clumpify. And if there are duplicates in there, it assumes that they, they were there because of XAMP, OK? And we'll remove them. So when we did that to this data set, it significantly reduced the duplication rates. So we went from 23 to 30% duplication rates to 9.9 to 11%. Okay, huge reduction in duplication rates. Now, this still doesn't look very good to me, but we've done these same libraries, repeated them again on another X10 run, and they were down around 2% or so. Okay, so it's very much dependent on the run, which is why we're always saying, please do things on the same run to compare if you really want to get accurate results. All right, so the take home then from that before Beth brings up the poll is remember multiple things, right? It all depends on the complexity of your starting DNA. How many unique fragments do you have in there? So the amount of DNA input and, and then the instrument that you're putting it on. What instrument are you putting it on? Does it have a huge capacity or does it limit the number of clusters? Because those are going to impact um, kind of like the sampling example that I showed you earlier. The instrument will kind of do the sampling for you if it has a lower capacity. And then finally, I don't know what the other one was, but those are the two big things. And so it's all very application, very experiment dependent. So please keep that, definitely keep that in mind as you're setting up your experiments and doing your analysis. Okay, take it away, Beth. The next poll. Um, basically, do you do your own fragment library prep or do you outsource them uh, to a core or service provider? All right, so kind of looks like most people are building their own libraries again. Interesting. All right, well, that's great. So I can't wait. We've got a question to build in their own libraries again. Interesting. All right, well, that's great. So I can't wait. We've got a question later on, too, that asks about applications. So I wonder if this is uh, application specific in terms of whether or not you're building your own libraries. So let's wait. I can't wait to see the data from that one is, but congratulations, everybody, on building your own libraries. Hopefully, um, you'll be using our kit to do it later. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Beth. All right, let's keep going. Got a lot to talk about. Okay, so now I want to um, move on to the to the challenges that you and other researchers are facing uh, when they're doing a 
doing DNA next-gen sequencing. And this is information that we've gathered by talking to people and finding out what their problems are and what type of challenges they face. So the first one is, and this is kind of the theme to today's talk, is a lot of kits require a lot of DNA input, okay? And a lot of you want to push the limits of sequencing. You want to use more smaller and smaller input amounts because you want to work with more and more challenging samples. And examples of that are FFPE and cell-free DNA. Those are notoriously difficult to get DNA from. Metagenomic samples are another, you name it. But there are a lot of options, um, a lot of sources of DNA that can give you very limiting amounts. PCR bias is another one. People are very worried about PCR bias, and rightfully so. Um, some fragments amplify better than others, um, and some amplify uh, and so what that leads to is very uneven coverage across a genome or target regions that you're working on. Okay, And then we talked a lot about inf uh, library construction and the importance of efficient adapter ligation, end repair ATLing and adapter ligation. So if you have inefficient libraries, you generate low percentage of fragments that are sequenceable in your library, and that decreases library complexity, which then in decreases coverage, depth uniformity. You'll see more zero regions uh, with no coverage and so forth. Now that's also going to decrease your confidence in the data and make um, interpretation of results more difficult. Finally, some of these kits require many, uh, have complicated workflows. Either they're, they're long or they have a lot of reagents that you have to add. And so that, whenever you have that situation, a lot of reagents, that increases the risk of error. I've done it. Um, I'm sure we've all done it. It's you might forget to add something, you might add something twice, you might add it to one tube and not the other, or both into two tubes. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot more risk for error with the more complicated workflows. And then the other thing we've heard is that a lot of people don't have access to mechanical shearing instruments like Kavaris. And so uh, that can be a roadblock for a lot of folks. And then finally, library prep costs. Like NGS is expensive. And some of these kits have very high price tags on them for each library that's being built. And so that can really stress budgets and um, inhibit uh, labs from attempting next-gen sequencing. So we've developed the NextSeq ultra-low DNA library kit and single indexing kits um, with the goal of trying to meet and overcome many of those challenges associated with library prep uh, that we've learned by talking to customers. So this is a DNA fragment library kit that uses PCR to amplify the libraries um, and also to add the indexes um, to the different libraries. Okay, So some of the take-homes with this kit are high-quality data. I hope to convince you of this today with the data that I'm going to show you, but we really do produce high, complex libraries um, that lead to better sequencing results. It's also sensitive, so we can go down to 50 picograms, as I started to talk about and alluded to earlier. Um, we can go all the way up to 75 nanograms as well. Um, you don't need to use more than that, so we stopped it at 75. Um, but again, this is going to be very much dependent on your sample type, the instrument that you're using, and, of course, uh, the goals of your experiments. Bias. So we've got a very robust PCR master mix in this kit that really does a good job of uniform PCR amplification, which, combined with the quality of the library that we make, um, leads to more uniform coverage uh, and fewer zero dropout regions. So I'll talk, show you some data to support that. It's also flexible. So I'm going to show you all data on whole genome sequencing and resequencing today. Um, but because it's a PCR amplified library, it's compatible with exome seq, chip seq, FFPE samples, and cell free DNA samples. So um, keep that in mind as you're doing your experiments. It's also fast. It's about a three-hour protocol. Gets your samples on the sequencers very fast, quickly. And then it's high value. So as I said, I know that sequencing, we know that sequencing is expensive. So we've tried to price this kit uh, affordably so that you get not only the high performance, but also lower cost so that you really do generate high value with these kits. Okay. Okay. How does it work? So we talked a little bit about what the kit is and some of the big features and benefits of it, but this is how it works. And this is important because we've optimized this whole process. Okay. So first you start with your, this looks very much like what we talked about earlier. You start with your DNA, fragment it or enzymatically she fragment, shear it or enzymatically fragment it, end repair A tail, and then ligate on an adapter. In this case, we call it the universal adapter. 
two points here. So this looks like fragments that are ready to sequence. They're not, okay? These are actually incomplete and not sequenceable, but they have the divergent um, ends, which is really important, um, okay? So, but they do not have indices and they do not have the P5 and P7 sequences that you need to work on an Illumina instrument. So the next step or next set of steps in the library prep is PCR amplification, um, which not only amplifies the library, but adds those P5 and P7 and index sequences to the fragments. So here's sort of how it works. Many adapters or universal adapters go into the PCR. You have two primers, one with an index, one with just a general P5 primer. Um, the P7 indexing primer binds first, will extend, <clears throat> makes these intermediate fragments. These aren't sequenceable yet because the, five, the P5 end isn't ready. And then the next cycle, the P5 primer will extend those molecules and create um, complete, um, fully sequenceable DNA fragments. Okay, And then these can go back and feed in back here. These can come down and these create the final products. Um, but you need two cycles basically with this approach to make this fragments um, fully sequenceable. Okay, so for a minimum number of PCR cycles with our kit, we recommend five, not four. And it's because you <clears throat> maximize the amount of sequenceable material with minimal number of cycles. Okay. Um, I saw the question about dual indexing. Just looking over, we've got another kit coming that will do dual indices. Uh, all right. So what applications? Well, as I said, this has really been tested extensively for whole genome sequencing. For human samples, we recommend a nanogram or more of DNA input. Um, you can go lower, absolutely, but just keep in mind um, about the expectations. As you go down in input amount, PCR duplicates will um, increase or duplicates will increase due to complexity of the DNA uh, that you're starting with, lower complexity of the DNA. Bacterial genomes, we've done 50 picograms on a MySeq. Awesome data. I'll show you that in a second. So um, definitely whole genome sequencing. It's great. But you could also use it for anything that requires PCR amplified libraries. So if you want to start with CHIP or MEDIP or FFPE or cell-free DNA samples, you can absolutely do that. Again, following the protocol and uh, generating DNA that's fully sequenceable. Again, again, it's going to depend on your input amounts and so forth, so keep that in mind. Okay. I should also point out that we have an ultra-small modified protocol. So sometimes, especially with FFPE or CHIP samples, you might want to do very small DNA inserts if possible. Well, because of the size of this universal adapter, because it's smaller, and because um, it's so efficient, we can actually make fragment libraries from things as, as small as 50 to 75 base pairs, okay? And get good quality and get rid of any junk uh, with the bead cleanup steps. So it's really a nice benefit to this kit. And if you're interested in ultra small, like you want really precise mapping of uh, transcription factor binding sites or something like that, definitely contact us. And then finally, exome capture or exome sequencing or custom targeted capture sequencing. Uh, here's a general protocol. We haven't tested it extensively here, um, but it absolutely is compatible with this approach. Okay, So you might have to do some optimization on your own, but um, definitely possible. So that brings us to our final poll question. Uh, Beth is going to bring it up. So what are the following applications and or sample types are you using now or in the near future? So um, please select all that apply. Um, and uh, don't be shy. Lots of good stuff here. Um, I couldn't put everything on here, but uh, oh wow, okay. So a lot of whole genome sequencing, a lot of exome sequencing. Oh, that's good. Most of you are using pretty high quality samples. That's good. FFPE, what an awful sample type to work with. Um, we definitely have done FFPE samples, so it will work with those kits just fine. Again, it's all about the quality of the input DNA that you're starting with. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like this kit's really well suited to most everybody. I mean, we've done most, as I said, we're going to talk about whole genome sequencing with the data examples. All right. Thanks, Beth. Let's put that poll away and keep going. All righty. Move it on. Okay, so here's the kit. This is what we're building. This question came up already. Um, so we've got a small kit right now. We're launching a big kit in a minute, and I'll tell you about that, but or in a month or two. But this first kit is a 12-reaction library prep kit. Um, 
priced at 264 bucks for the kit, and then we'll talk about per reaction costs later. We have also sell two indexing kits. Each of those indexing kits has 12 unique indices and enough of each primer mix to do four uh, libraries. So for each indexing kit, you can make a total of 48 uh, amplified libraries, okay? each with 12. And then we've got two sets and of indices in, uh, so the first set is 1 through 12, and the second set is 13 through 16, 18 through 23, 25 and 27. Those might look familiar to many of you. Those are identical to the TrueSeq LT indices. And so the numbers here correspond to the same index numbers um, from the Illumina LT kit. Okay, so you can, they're interchangeable in terms of the index sequences themselves. Now the ultra low kit, the library kit contains all the enzymatic parts. So enzyme mix for A tailing and end repair, buffer, ligase, the master mix for PCR and elution buffer. Notice how simple this is, okay? There's not very many components here. So it's really, you'll see how easy the workflow is in a minute. Then uh, the indexing kits, as I said, contain the universal adapter that we talked about and then the 12 different primer indexing mixes. They're pre-mixed, ready to go. There's a common primer, primer in all of them for P5Ns and then the indexing primers um, to give you your unique indices. Again, single indices. Now, what we will have coming soon is a 96 reaction kit. And when we come out with that kit, it's going to be optimized for volumes and, and tube setups for big doing plates. Okay, 96 well plates. And then we'll also have sets of dual index primers so that you can get a unique 96 unique combinations out of those dual indices. Okay. And if you need different primers and so forth, let me know because we we're very interested in what, what the what our customers need for uh, primers and indices. Okay, here's all the indices. There'll be a quiz later. No, nah, just kidding. No quiz later. In case you needed the information's here, it's also in our catalog. Okay, or in our user manual, excuse me. All right, so let's walk, talk about the workflow. It's easy, okay? So everything is single tube. So from start, once you've got your sheared or fragmented DNA, you start in a tube, you go all the way through to the cleanup step before PCR. No changing of tubes in here, okay? That allows us to use the ultra low input amounts and it also um, helps increase efficiency because we're not losing anything. Then there's a bead cleanup step, PCR setup, PCR cycling, bead cleanup again and size selection to finish it off. Whole thing takes two hours. Hands-on time is only an hour and 27 minutes. Now, I'm going to show you all data today from DNA that's been sheared on a Kavaris instrument. But I want to remind you that this kit is super flexible. We've got the me mechanical shearing protocols in the user manual, and we have a very detailed enzymatic fragmentation protocol using Shearase Plus from Zymo Research in the user manual. We didn't include it in the kit. We wanted to give you the flexibility to use the enzyme of your choice. We strongly recommend this one because it was the best for us. Um, and there are detailed, there's detailed information in the user manual. Please follow, if you do use this kit, please follow our user manual protocol. Zymo doesn't have details for working with 50 picograms or, of uh, DNA. So we've optimized all of that for library prep and that's all in the protocol. The other thing is this simple product workflow and low number of components that have to be added really makes this kit very automation friendly as well. And then of course we got to compare ourselves to the competition. We're not the fastest, I will admit that, and that's okay. Um, we're at three hours. Um, Kappa's just as fast. NEB's is pretty close with a little bit less hands-on time. Illumina's the slowest. Um, with the nano DNA LT library prep kit, okay? Um, three hours, three and a half hours and a lot more hands-on time. They have these size selections in the middle of everything. Um, but in terms of speed, we're right on par with everybody else. And again, the simplicity makes this kit a lot easier to use. All right, now I talked a lot about, in the beginning, about the quality of the library. How good a library do you have? Because that dictates how your sequencing is going to go and the results that you're going to get. Um, and so we're going to talk about efficiency next. And what that means is how many fragments in your library have adapters at both ends compared to all the D final DNA in your library? This is the only sequenceable material. This stuff is just junk. Okay. And so we've talked about this before, but basically what we did with the different kits in our kit 
is we built libraries according to everybody's protocols. Then we used PCR to quantitate the amount of sequenceable material, that is um, material with adapters at both ends. Then we measured all the double-stranded DNA in the library using uh, qubit to do fluorescent dye DNA quantitation. So that's the denominator. And then we divided the qPCR quantity by the fluorescence quantity and multiplied by 100 to get percent efficiency. Now that's quite a bit oversimplified here. We have standards, we do all that stuff, um, but this is basically how it's done. And what I want to point out also is that, remember, we're using a universal adapter that's not complete, and we want to measure this step before we do PCR. You can't measure efficiency after PCR because PCR only amplifies the good stuff, right, the sequenceable material. So if you want to measure how good you're adding your adapters, how well you're adding your adapters to the ends of these molecules, you need to do it before PCR. And so in order to do that with the different kits, um, you know, NEB has a balloon adapter, Kappa has a full-length adapter, we have the universal adapter. We de designed a universal qPCR primer set that works out across all the kits. And then we measured library efficiency. And what we did was we did it on two separate sets of libraries, us, Kappa Hyperprep and NEB Ultra, again, before any PCR steps. We did three organisms with different GC contents, okay? And then we used the qPCR and qubit to measure um, efficiency of adapter ligation. And then we normalized everything to leucogen. Turns out we are the best in all cases. And then we normalized everybody to us, okay? So one is um, us, and then everybody is down below that. And you can see that we're two to 10 times better than Kappa and NEB at um, adapter ligation, okay? And that's the crux, that's, the, that's central to everything. If you don't have a good adapter ligation, it doesn't matter how good your PCR is, you're not gonna create fragments that are sequenceable if they weren't there, okay? You can only amplify the sequenceable material. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that we can create libraries from as little as 50 picograms of DNA, as I said, okay? And here's an example. So a lot of detail here in this slide. All the details are down here. Everything we're doing and I'm talking about is duplicate and triplicate libraries. We really wanted to nail down the quality of our library prep kit. And the only way to do that really, again, is to do replicates, okay? So we made libraries from 50, 250 to 500 picograms of input all the way up to 75 nanograms. These are the number of PCR cycles we used. We sampled all the reads to 312,000, remember? That's what you got to do if you want to do fair comparisons. That should give us a theoretical 10x coverage. Number of mapped reads, percent of mapped reads, you can see they go up as you use more DNA. That makes sense, right? It's going to be it's going to be more difficult to make sequenceable material from ultra low input amounts. Duplicate rates, 50 picograms, only 0.84%. That's pretty darn good, right? And it goes all the way down to 0.02% with 75 nanograms. Again, this is partly due to PCR, but it's really due to the number of unique fragments, the very few unique fragments present in 50 picograms versus 75 nanograms. Huge number of unique fragments possible here. Coverage depth goes up. We were shooting for 10x, goes up to about 9.8 with 75 nanograms of input. So everything pretty much gets better with more DNA, but again, still very good with 50 picograms. And this is probably the most important set of data right down here. So these are the number of zero locations, that is areas of the genome with no coverage, okay? And here's the total length. So we only missed uh, 2,600 base pairs of DNA out of the whole E. coli genome with 50 picograms of input. And obviously it decreased by about 1,200 base pairs with 75 nanograms of input. But again, uh, that's not much of a difference considering how much more DNA is used, okay? And both of them are very low amounts of zero coverage. Okay. And of course, we didn't include any competitors there because most of them can't go down to, 50, nobody can really go down to 50 picograms. So then this slide tries to show you um, how uniform the coverage is, okay? This is just taking a similar, a similar experiment where we mapped, we got to this level of coverage by sampling um, certain specific number of reads, same reads for all the, all the genomes and all the kits. Again, done in triplicate, 300 base pair libraries. This is the standard deviation of coverage depth, okay? So smaller is better here. It means that there's less up and down in coverage. And then this percent CV is obviously the standard deviation divided by the average coverage depth. So as depth goes up and deviation goes down, the CVs decrease. And you can see it doesn't look like much, but in fact, 
um, it is. Okay, remember these are all triplicates, pretty high quality data, and this and the uh, variation is pretty low as well. I didn't show it here, but we see this over and over again with this library prep kit compared to the competitors. We also looked at GC or AT bias. Um, in this case, what we did was we did the same three genomes again with different GC content to make sure there was nothing weird about our kit and the GC content of the genomes. And in this case, what we're plotting is normalized coverage. So the average coverage of a, a window with X percent GC, and the GC content increases from left to right. I didn't put that on the bottom. It doesn't really matter. Um, versus the overall average coverage. So if average coverage was 10X, it's lower out in this GC content and higher out in this GC content. But the blue is represents the majority or the percent of the genome with that GC content. So this is really where you need to worry, right? And what and one would be perfect. If everything was across one perfect flat line, that would be the best results. And what you can see is that we're closest to one in all of these particular experiments. And again, remember, we're doing triplicate genomes here and getting really high quality data. The variability out here, don't worry about it. It's just because there's so few reads out in these low or high GC content areas that you just are going to see a lot more variability. All right, let's talk about some de human data on uh, with deeper sequencing. Okay, so um, this was an experiment where we compared our ultra low kit to the Kappa Hyper Prep kit. Um, we made 10 nanogram libraries, uh, input libraries, and we ran them on a high seq 2500. So this is a non-pattern flow cell instrument. Okay, and we used eight cycles of PCR for both libraries, and we looked at the variable various metrics here that I'm showing. Okay, and what you can see is we had about the same number of reads that we analyzed, coverage uh, mapped reads higher percentage, fragment length. So we started with 300 base pair inserts you know, a mean insert size of 300 base pairs. And we followed each protocol um, exactly for that size insert. And what you can see is that our libraries were closer to the original insert size than the Kappa kit. They were a lot smaller, okay? So you're gonna miss a lot more information uh, with smaller fragment libraries. And if you're asking for 300 base pair inserts, you wanna be as close to that as possible, okay? Duplicate rates are significantly lower, okay, with our kit. Coverage was significantly higher. Again, that's going to be a combination of the size of the reads, mostly the size of the reads that we were getting, the inserts that we were mapping. Uh, and then that, of course, all adds up to better coverage. And you might look at this. This is 0.87%. You might go, oh, that's not really that much better. Well, for the human genome, 0.87% turns out to be 24 million more base pairs covered with the ultra-low kit. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of region being missed by this kit versus this kit. Okay. All right, here's another one. This is now using the HiSeq X10, okay? Remember, this is the one that has a lot of XAMP duplicates possible. So in this experiment, it's a similar experiment using 10 nanograms of input. We sampled all the libraries down to 200 million reads to get about 10x coverage or somewhere in that range. And um, we used eight cycles for our kit and Kappa, and NEB recommended seven, so we used seven cycles for NEB. So this is the point I want to make here with cycles and duplicates. Okay, let's keep that in mind. So I highlighted in red where we win, basically. More mapped reads, again, better insert sizes. NEB was a little bit bigger, but still, following their protocols, um, we ended up with um, smaller inserts than what we started with. So we started again with 300 base pair mean size inserts, and we ended up with fragment inserts that were about 290 with our kit, and then 190 and 225 with NEB and Kappa. Duplicate rates, significantly lower on the HiSeq X10 when you use Clumpify to remove the optical duplicates. Coverage depth was significantly better. Again, it's a combination of mappability and insert sizes. And then autosomal coverage was pretty darn good across the board. Uh, let's see, we were better than Kappa and almost identical to NEB in this particular experiment. Again, I would argue that, you know, we're all doing pretty well but there's a lot of um, benefits here um, to the ultra-low kit. All right. Oh, and then just to remind you, 3.5% duplicates versus 2.1, one fewer PCR cycle than we used, okay? And we still had fewer duplicates. 
So it's a, duplicate rates are a lot more complicated than just the number of PCR cycles. Okay. All right, and then complexity. So everybody talks and asks, you know, everybody asks about complexity of the libraries, and that data that I just showed you really addresses complexity already, right? You're not going to get better coverage. You're not going to get um, uh, better uh, depth and uniformity unless you have more complex libraries, okay? But we went ahead and took those same X10 data uh, sets and we used the classical Picard um, complexity analysis. Um, it was part of DNA Nexus. We used Picard to generate, to determine library size slash complexity. In this case, we had very few PCR duplicates in this experiment, uh, not PCR, uh, XAMP duplicates, so we didn't use Clumpify, and then the results of each set are shown, of duplicates are shown here, and here's the bar graph. This is bigger bars are better, and you can see that we're significantly better than the Kappa Hyper Prep Kit and the NEB Next Ultra 2 Kit, and here's the raw numbers down below, okay? So as you'd expect from the quality of the data, um, when you actually use Picard to measure complexity, um, the kit's very, very good at producing highly complex libraries, larger libraries. So I just want to finish up now talking about cost. Um, I don't want to dwell on this. It, it, you know, in most cases, it's about performance. But if we can provide um, that performance to you at a lower cost, it's obviously going to be a benefit to you. And so what I've done is um, take put I've calculated out here the cost per library for both the enzymatics, the library prep kit itself, and the adapters and indexing primers um, as well. And so you can see we're at 22 bucks, $22 US for uh, library prep, and then a little bit under $4 for the adapter and um, PCR primer mixes. Okay, so that comes out to about $26 in total. So we compared it to Kappa, we compared it to the NEB Ultra 2. NEB gets closest. Um, Swift is really expensive, okay? And then um, Illumina is also more expensive. There is an asterisk here because Illumina does include both their um, adapters and PCR because Illumina does include both their um, adapters and PCR primers in the kit. Um, so there's only one line here. And they also include beads. But from what I understand um, from folks using the Illumina kit is they don't actually use the beads in the kit. They use the uh, Coulter, Beckman Coulter Ampere XP beads. Okay. And so you're kind of paying for it when you're not even using it. But that's what I've heard from most customers. Um, if you do something differently, that'd be, we'd love to hear about that too. All right. So lower cost. So that brings us to the summary. Um, Hopefully, I've shown you enough data, talked about the importance of library construction, efficiency, um, and, and, and really driven home the idea that this kit is probably the highest efficiency PCR kit available. And that translates into multiple factors, multiple results. That means you can go down as low as 50 picograms of input. But remember, it's going to depend on your goals and of your experiments and the instruments that you're using and the, and the sample types, okay, complexity of your samples. But you can, in fact, go down to 50 picograms with no trouble. Um, it's also cost effective, and it produces that high quality sequencing data that I told you about. Now, as I said, it's also been, uh, we show, I showed you a lot of data on whole genome at sequencing and resequencing. So we've got the most experience with that. But because it's a PCR amplified library, it's perfectly suitable to a lot of other um, non whole genome sequencing applications like exome seek, like chip seek. Um, contact us if you're interested in doing that. We can provide you some guidance on that. And we're in the process of generating a lot more application specific data that we're going to add to um, our manuals and, and, and white papers and such so that you'll have uh, more concrete uh, information to start with. Talked about price a little bit. And then the protocol. Hopefully, um, you know. When you take a look at the protocol, you'll see how easy it is. Um, we've got a quick protocol that you can look at as well for experienced users, um, but it really does use minimal components, so that reduces your chance of error, um, and it simplifies automation, as I said. So definitely keep those in mind. Um, most of it's about performance, but you know simplicity and um, cost definitely come into play uh, when you're considering what kit to use. So I'm going to stop there. We've actually got about five minutes. That's great. I ran a little 
long last time at 8 o'clock this morning. Um, uh, Beth is going to read any questions you might have, but before we get to that, if you do have questions that don't get answered today, um, absolutely contact our tech support team. They've got our information here, or contact me. I'm happy to either uh, answer the question for you or um, talk to our R&D and tech support scientists to get you the information that you need. I would like to thank our speaker, Rob Brazos, and also thank all the members of our audience for joining us today and for your great questions. Please note that if you do have additional questions, again, just contact the folks on your screen.